Hello and welcome to a very, very, very much anticipated episode of the Churros y Tacticas podcast. Happy New Year to all of you beautiful listeners all around the world. Happy New Year to the beautiful and glowing Diego Lorin. Happy birthday to the... Happy birthday. Happy New Year to the sun-deprived Canadian over here who is sitting inside of a snowstorm and, and multiple layers on. Thanks for bearing with us, guys. Um, it's been a while. And Diego and I are hitting record without any small talk. No, like, hey, man, how are you? What's up? How was your holidays? Just record and bam, an intro. And that's how we do the churros. So, Diego, welcome. What's up? What's new? Where do we start? What's up, bro? Well, I think we got to start with, uh, again, the sort of coordination we've got going this we're in sync when it comes to dressing similar styles, man. Like whether it's, uh, you know, we're both supporting shirts or beanies or in uh, this case, you know, the hoodie <clears throat> with, in my case, uh, a chaleco on top, a vest. You've got the nice jeans, the, the what do you call it, a denim coat? Yeah, denim. Uh, kind of like, uh, remember Dumb and Dumber when they go skiing? <laughs> and they got like they're in their in the lobby of that chalet. It's kind of like that, like you know, kind of. What's That's a classic uh, scene? The Aspen, the Aspen attire. So we're good. We're good over here. Uh, I enjoyed the break. Had a good holidays, and uh, you know I'm ready to come back. Batteries are fully charged. I hope your holidays were good, man. They were good. Uh, you know, it's it's so funny because you, we dropping off the kids on the first day back at school. Yeah, parents making small talk, teachers making small talks. They're like, "Oh man, it went by too quick." Oh, it so, sucks. We back at work. I'm like, "You're on your own on that one." This guy was excited to get back to his routine of work, work, work. I love working. I miss these podcasts, man. So I was happy to ship the kids off and uh get everyone back to their normal routine. But you you were you were traveling, right? You were not around. You were not home? No, yeah. So we went around to uh we made our rounds to see our families. It had been, you know, almost 4 years th I think 3 consecutive years where we weren't unable to travel and see uh our families. Of course, my wife being from Switzerland, I also have uh my parents living there, so it tends to be a spot where our families reunite. In some cases, we get to celebrate it to get together. And since it had been such a long time that we had the chance to celebrate Christmas together, uh, I had my sisters over, some of, um, you know, uh, the, the, the nieces and nephew came along as well. So, and in the end, we got all of them to come on over to the area, Ticino, where my wife is from and her family lives we got them to come over there to celebrate christmas have a big dinner with the both families and it was really nice um after that so for initially it was with my wife's parents then i got to spend some time over with my immediate family in the german region of switzerland where my parents live and where i lived uh, many many years as well so it was, yeah, it was good, man. It was good. It was some much needed uh, family catch up, uh, some, you know, intimate family time. And then we got back here early January and we had a little trip as well planned for just us, the four of us, uh, my wife and I, kid, my kids to uh, go try to see if we could find the snow over in the uh, Catalan um, Pyrenees region. And uh, the kids got to do some skiing. There wasn't enough snow for us to ski. At least it wasn't worth it. I I don't know if you oh you should come here skiing, skiing or snowboarding. Yeah, but uh, there just wasn't enough for me to kind of make the effort and go. It was more important for me that my kids would learn how to ski so that when the good times, the proper snow comes around, maybe they could tag along and. Uh, ski all together so it was good man it was all positive like i said i really enjoyed the break i needed it um and here we are man kids are back at school as you said for some reason i thought they would start earlier in, in canada here we have reyes which is you know kind of the, the equivalent of santa claus on the <clears throat> 6th of jan so the 5th and 6th so I thought. january uh 
second or third they were back. Can't well, remember were, which okay. one. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so yeah. when you said you dropping off the kids, et cetera, all that, you're talking last week. This, for me, that was today. Oh, wow. Yeah, see, I can't imagine the break being that long. I just, again, like, I don't like breaks. I don't like it. I, yeah. You know, I can't, I don't know what to do with myself, but sit down and, and do nothing. I can't do that. You know, it was, it's good when I, you know, when I'm active with the kids. I'm taking them out. We're going to places. We're hanging out. That's cool. We're going hiking. Haven't done skiing yet, but that's definitely on the list. A lot of swimming. Uh, so that's fun, but like the idea of just sitting and having extended holidays sounds like a nightmare to me. But, you know, we did have a few exchanges here and there on Instagram. You, you, you were, I, th- I think I ruined your holiday with my Carlo Ancelotti Instagram reel. And uh, you got those angry, angry reply. Ancelotti, you, you're loud, bias, bias. Oh my think God. You, it it I can't, threw I can't, your holiday I, I off into a, a, to, into a tizzy. Actually, properly think for a minute what you were referring to. I was like, I don't know where he's going with this, but uh, that seems like a lifetime ago. But yeah, what was it exactly? You you were hailing him as the best manager <clears throat> ever? Or, I, I don't know. I said that, that I don't think there's a better manager at getting the best out of his players. Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just funny because... I, 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 it still seems like yesterday you were demanding Jalot, uh, Angelotti out after that heavy defeat against Barca, and it's just funny how I'm you know, famously time... I famously been bipolar on Ancelotti, very whole, much, so. yeah, very much. But I'm all in right now, so I'm on, I'm on that end of the oh, spectrum. You don't have a right choice. <laughs> It'll be annoying for you if you're going anti Angelotti now that he's renewed until <clears throat> 2026. Well, how in touch were you with Barca? Because obviously you guys had that massive uh, game winner against Las Palmas at the end. And yeah. that was much needed. I mean, big scenes there after underwhelming performance or so. I mean, you know me, I think, you you know, if you can get a win at the end when you're not playing well, that's amazing. I mean, three points is three points. So I know you're probably a little bit more harsh on, on that stuff it, than me, but. Yeah, I mean, look, it was, uh, it, it's. It's just going to be very, very hard, and I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I've already decided, I think a few podcasts ago, that I'm going to try to uh, look at things more from a positive lens, or should I say at least not get, let this team currently affect me and my mood Good. Uh, as much as it has been, uh, because... I think we have to accept that it's going to be a, a bumpy road mm-hmm. uh, and these ugly wins are going to continue, you know, hopefully wins are, continue, are going to continue to drop uh, and come our way as long as the whole, I feel, surrounding of, of Football Club Barcelona at the moment is just so negative. Everything is very, very negative. I think it would be, you know, a miracle for this team to start playing miraculously well and start playing the type of football that we saw against, you know, a Betis, for example. Um, and I say that because, yeah, everything is just, it, 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 it's all very negative. Uh, it, it's, it's constant criticism towards uh, Xavi, uh, towards him personally as well. You know, watching TV channels, reading the press uh, can be downright, um, What's the word I'm looking for? It's just it's it like I mean it's frustrating. It it, it is frustrating and it does get it, it wears you out. Um, so I don't know where to go with. I I try to limit myself really to just watching the game and then coming on the podcast and uh, have you hear my reaction sort of as raw and 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 nuanced as possible without letting outside noises influence me because mm-hmm. whether it's ESPN. Uh, even yesterday, I don't know. There's a clip now going viral on on Twitter. So you know, you see, I'm still active, obviously, on social media. I, I, I saw that you locked your Twitter profile. I did do that. Yeah, yeah. I've been getting way too much spam. It, spam. It's it's insane. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, yeah, I try to filter it a bit. But anyway, I do catch wind, obviously, of a general sentiment and what is written in the press, at least in terms of headlines. But there's something. There's a clip going viral. I think this morning or since yesterday, where in ESPN you can hear a commentator say that this bars has disgusting. Wow, um, disgusting! Yeah. They use the word disgusting. 
Dasco. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, was it the Spanish commentator? Yes. Okay. Um, what did and, it, was, would it have been Hugo Sanchez? Because he is the ESPN Deportes commentator. He's one of them. Like it, it could have been yeah. the other one too. I, I don't know. I don't know from the voice. I don't know who it is, quite frankly. Okay. So, uh, but uh, it just goes to show the kind of disrespect <clears throat> that I uh, is aimed towards Barca at the moment, and I, I don't want to be. Uh, I don't want to fall in the trap of being overly negative. Clearly, sure. The style of play is, as I keep reiterating, is leaving a lot to de- to be desired. Xavi will be the first one uh, to be critical with his own team, um, but he tries to get positives where he can. You know, then then there was another uh, moment in a press conference. This was after Las Palmas game, where he was asked by uh, Elena Condis, uh, a reporter of uh, El Cope, uh, a Madrid-based uh, media outlet radio station, one of the biggest ones. Had the result not been a win, what would the state of mind or the state of the team be, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, it's it's the, the, the point to highlight here is the context or the framing rather of these types of questions. Where even Chavi's like, you know, you would never. Well, why are you asking me this question? Why are you asking me this hypothetical question when you wouldn't ask that kind of question at other coaches? And and I think he's right to point that out. You know, there was a time, and you know. I don't know how much you were watching uh, uh, Van Gaal's Barca in those days, Kian. But I think, you know, I remember those days, certainly. Uh, and I remember them when a moment went viral. Uh, obviously, there was not the internet then that we have uh, today. I'm talking 97, 98 season, I believe it was. Um, where, you know, the famous phrase, siempre negativo, nunca positiva. Uh, he pronounces it in classic Dutch uh, accent and, and, and horribly wrong as well. Um, but uh, that press conference where he loses his mood, he loses his temper, uh, gets very angry and upset at a reporter for always asking him neg- or, uh, uh, questions in a negative tone. Um, and, and that's kind of like what it is. I mean... In, in, I think the Catalan press is is notoriously notoriously known for framing things uh, in a negative light. I mean, even Pep was highly criticized in his day. Um, not to say Luis Enrique, for example, and and it's now Xavi who can do no right, you know. And you can you can point at uh, certain things. You can point at the fact that uh, yes, it has been. Uh, how many games? I, I believe it's over 12, 20 odd. I don't, I don't remember how many games it's been. Kian, you brought the point forward to the podcast uh, a few episodes ago that Barca haven't been able to win a game uh, with more than just a goal difference. Uh, and I believe it was the Antwerp game uh, in the Champions League, if I'm not mistaken. That was the and last that, one, I think, yeah. And and that's certainly something to be concerned about and, 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 and needs to be improved. Uh, I think that yesterday was a game that we could have easily put away in the first half. Uh, I think there's sort of a, a perfect storm happening at the moment where the climate is very negative when and, and, uh, with regards to the surroundings, the fan base and the press around Barca, the club in general. Um and you add to that also the fact that the players, I mean, they are not fino at the moment. They're, they, they are not accurate. They are not banging in the, the, the goals that they were uh, last season. It's, uh, you know, I've, there are articles floating about that Barca, you know, the drop in accuracy and the drop in uh, uh, efficiency, rather, comparing Barca last season to this season. And it's, it's astonishing. Add yeah. to that, of course, also the individual <clears throat> errors, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. It's uh, it, 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 things are ugly at the moment, um, and it's hard, I think, for any coach and, and players as well to turn that around and start playing uh, all of a sudden with a magic switch 
just you know infinitely better and start winning games by you know three four goal margins i think time is needed i will reserve my judgment with regards to chavi until at the end of the season and just take every game as as it goes you know uh, obviously i hope for more wins and if if it's without as much suffering than all the better i think it would make these podcasts a little bit more entertaining as well uh because it is hard to come on, on on this podcast every week or twice a week as we do and you know have to talk about the, the state of affairs at Barça or or judge my opinions based on only what what I see which is it's it's not no es muy alegre it's not joyful okay it's not a joyful experience but uh, hey it is what it is and um you know I'm I'm, I'm looking forward to Victor Roque uh, getting into form i think what we've seen the minutes and i would like to know your opinion if you did get to see him uh what you have of him so far obviously just you know what was it 20 minutes in over the course of uh let's say 40 minutes over the course of two games but um let's look into the future man let's see what the future holds hopefully we can hang in there now is the super copa kian a little mini tournament that we won last year so potential classical coming up <laughs> potential classical yeah <clears throat> Which I, I didn't really even fully realize until I was looking at the Super Cup schedule and I was trying to plan my month. I was like, oh, potential Classico um, that I might, uh, I believe it falls on my son's birthday. So I'm kind of screwed if that happens. Oh. Uh, so what was I going to say? The thought of, you mentioned, you know, it's better for this podcast if Barca are, are back to their glory. I was thinking about that actually. I was on my run a couple of days ago, and uh, these are the things I think about. I was thinking about the future of Churros and Farsa suck. And <laughs> it's like it's like that meme where <clears throat> the, the the wife is like, "I wonder what he's thinking about." Is he thinking about other girls, and I'm like just like thinking about Churros and the future of Barca when I'm running. He's cheating on me. Yeah, he's you're cheating thinking. on me. <laughs> and I was thinking like, what if Barca suck? Like, <laughs> what if it just gets worse? And five years from now, like there, it's just financial turmoil. It's a disaster. It's like Milan post, you know, Calcio Poli. I was like, what happens to Churros? What happens to Diego? Is he just going to be a shell of himself sitting on the podcast and it's not as fun? I'm sure everything will be okay. Um, you know, I was I watched that last Palmas what, game. What were your concluding thoughts, though? I want to know. I, how, they, how there was no closure. The run just continued without closure. I didn't get the answer. <laughs> There was no divine answer that came to me in that moment. Okay. I don't know. It's an unknown, uncharted territory. The only, the only I mean, the uh, parallel we have is, you, and you mentioned Van Gaal days. Yeah, I was alive for that. Um, I was alive when I was alive. No, I, I, was I alive. said alive. I, I meant, I don't know how closely you were no, no. following bad assignment. Well, I, I, quite closely, actually. Like, mm. And I, you know, the, remember the era, of course you do, the rock and back and... <clears throat> um, who else was that? I mean, that, that, this was uh, Cliver was there, Lucho was there. We got a, a, a second Giovanni that didn't turn out to be uh, Giovanni Van Bronckhorst, that one, or there was oh, another one. There was a Brazilian Giovanni. Oh yeah, I remember. Uh, yes. And of course, around that time, you there was a lot of hype over Javier Saviola. He eventually yes. came in. Riquelme, yes, yes. Um, a lot of a uh, Riquelme discourse with the this. New documentary. I don't know if you saw. We can get to it later. Um, well, guys, this is what I was going to say. I did watch the last Palmas game. I do have some thoughts on Vitor Roque. Not that much. But what struck me during the last Palmas game is like, and you're right, like Barcelona probably put should have put that game away sooner. I mean, they had huge, two huge chances late. The Vitor Roque one. Two, the, both the Vitor Roque ones were insane. Um uh, but there was enough shot volume and enough chances you guys had to to do better. But it wasn't great. Like it's not like we're talking about, you know, ninety four Barca or anything like that. It was the standards have fallen. Mm -hmm. But what struck me was that Las Palmas played a very open game. They brought their line very high, which is very risky, especially against a team like Barca. And if you did that against Barca in years past, that was suicide. 
Mm. Like that's just a recipe to shoot yourself in the heart. Mm-hmm. But this Barca, it's not doesn't seem that suicidal. I mean, you saw Girona have a very open game against you guys and score four goals. And Las Palmas, sure, like they didn't they they got into dangerous positions, but I don't think they got off dangerous shots. That was the difference because they just have less talent. But they certainly had their moments on the break behind Barca's high line, and they themselves just weren't that exposed with this version of Barca. It was kind of an underwhelming performance either way. Yeah. And I was thinking, like, you know, there there was a time not long ago that playing a, a high line against Barca, I mean, it could have got you fired for doing that. But it seems to be working right now. And the, you talk about efficiency. Obviously, Lewandowski is not scoring. The defense has fallen off the cliff. To me, this team's success in the second half of the season hinges on one of these two things happening. Lewandowski getting his shit together or Vito Roque being a savior <laughs> and i don't i don't i don't really criticize him for those two big chances i mean you can criticize him if you want but it kind of reminded me of raul's debut in la liga he missed two sitters so you know you got to be patient in that situation but the hunger seemed to be there at least to get into those positions i like this movement i like yeah. this uh movement a lot and uh you know the the, the chance creation as well uh, we're not expecting nobody's expecting him to be the next you know ronaldo nazario to put on a barca shirt or a romario and start taking la liga by storm uh ojalá <clears throat> hopefully uh but you know we got to give him time obviously i like his movement i like the fact that he was uh, receiving the ball from his teammates as well i think they were generous with him um uh, trying to get you know trying to get the ball to him and uh, his off the ball movement, looking for the space, uh, they're gonna go in at some point, and you know we'll see his effectiveness uh, in front of goal, how it will you know turn out until from now until the end of the season. Uh, I think Xavi will increase his minutes as uh, the games go on as well, especially given the state of Robert Lewandowski, which is still uh, a shadow of himself, as you put it earlier. That I that I couldn't agree with more, and um, you know it's it's like for example in in the Copa game yesterday, the first half was I mean Barça steamrolled. Como se llama Barbaros? What was that? Shit, I'm, I don't think we have any uh, listeners from the humble side of uh, Barbastro, but uh, <laughs> don't want to butcher the name regardless. Uh, a game where in the first half we could have been up, you know, three, four nil. But also in those chances, you saw that the forwards right now just, I would say, you know, lack confidence, Kian. It's, it's, their yeah. finishing is, is, is not, you know, it, it, it lacks the spark. That's why I was actually amazed that you guys dug deep and won that game, in part because when Las Palmas scored, there was, it seemed to me there was a little bit of head hanging. It's like, oh, again, like, I don't know. It just Here we doesn't. Go, yeah. The confidence is, is off to me, for sure. There's no question about that. <clears throat> and uh, they got to find it, man. Big game's coming up. Second half Big. season doesn't get any easier. Champions League. I think, I think you know, a, a, as much as we kind of despise having to interrupt the domestic league for tournaments, especially that are now being played in, in, in foreign lands, this Little Supercopa could be a turning point, hopefully, for Xavi's team. It's going to be hard because we're playing Osasuna uh, in the, the, the first game. Uh, Osasuna side that, you know, over the course of the past, what, could, what can we say, like decade or so under Arrasate has always been a very tough side to beat. Um, they're away from El Sadar, so maybe that's uh, a good thing. You will know what they are like in finals, in, in the Copa final, which I think was a little bit underwhelming, at least for anybody that didn't want to see uh, Madrid win that Copa final, at least with such ease. But we'll see uh, how the you know how Barca <clears throat> fare. My point being is that if this turn this tournament turns out uh, with a win for Barca, maybe it could be a turning point and somewhat of a trampoline to at least see. Uh, the side improve in confidence and therefore play in this uh, final stretch or second half of the, the season. And with the Champions League, of course, still up for grabs as well. This is a good segue. I think 
you hate when I say this, but it, to me it's a truth. Your whole season, the momentum shift is all about what happens in the game against Real Madrid. You lose again. Look, everything, all the problems started in that classical loss when when Bellingham scored the game winner. It's like, oh shit, this is was our Champions League final. It's over. Throw away the season. Now you could potentially swing it back if you beat Real Madrid in the final. It could be like, yes, this is an actual trophy. I mean, think about it. Like, go. Let's go back to. Xavi's first Clásico, if I remember correctly, was the Spanish Super Cup, wasn't it? When you lost, uh, and then yes, uh, yes, yes, of course, of lost. course. Yeah, I don't like that. That was your first trophy of the season. Was that loss because you you won that moral but, trophy? Well, and, that was a turning point. Let's be honest. That's my point. I mean, the team was in, not in ninth at that, but he took over in ninth. I don't know where we were, but we finished the season second. So that's my point. Like you, uh, you interpreted that game. Because you looked at the performance and not the the result. Right, 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 right. You were like, oh, shit, we're actually able to compete. We got a young squad. Chavi Ball works. And that was like a big turning point for you guys, I, I thought. I mean, you yeah. took something away from that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so maybe you can use that as a launching pad. Of course, if you lose that game and you get dominated, they, they might just disband the club at that point it would be devastating for you guys dude it's it, like i said i'm not gonna come on this pod and be negative <laughs> i should have just stopped there just... <laughs> at first i thought you were just gonna quit if barca lose that game i mean look <laughs> no no my point being is that it's it's easy to go down spiral down that black hole uh, that the Barca community have created uh, for ourselves at the moment and be super negative, start talking about a loss in the Super Cup against Osasuna or, God forbid, in, in, in the final against uh, Real Madrid. Uh, Anytime you feel sad, just go to uh, Zona Blaugrana and Mr. Satan's Twitter accounts and just watch God some conspiracy them. videos to keep your soul recharged. Don't listen to what this man says. Follow them. God bless them. Nothing but facts being spit. Yeah. Uh, as long as as, as long factual as, uh, as they're the not aliens being on, on the earth. No, 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 no. You should. I wish you would give it the time of day to kind of analyze it with a cold head. I think. What aliens or? B- both, both. Uh, the, 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 okay. Thona and Mister Satan, as well as the alien topic. Okay. But um, how do you feel about? Obviously, you're ecstatic. You're excited that Angelotti is renewed uh, for another couple of seasons until 2026. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about that? I, I mean, now that we're on on hypotheticals, uh huh. <clears throat> how do you think if seats were reversed, meaning if you know Xavi was Madrid's coach, you guys had just come off of winning La Liga in Xavi's first full season. Mm-hmm. And what do you think the state of affairs would be in Madrid had Xavi been Madrid's coach and, and you know, the, the, the results? Because if, if you're looking at it, really, not a whole lot of points are separating us in the league standings at the moment. Madrid is not, I mean, playing light years better than Barca. I think we can both agree on that. What do you think? Do you think the press would be as hard as they are and the fan base as hard as they are with Xavi as they um, as, uh, as they are in, in the Catalan press? Yes, because just like the Catalan press and you described the ruthlessness of it, the Madrid press is just as bad if Rams are playing well. I'll also push back. Push back. I think Real Madrid are playing well, uh, and I like. Sometimes I forget that we were missing half of our team. The fact, like, our only loss was the Atletico game. That was it. We didn't lose a single game after that, and the seven. It's a seven point difference between us and you guys right now. I think if Real Madrid were playing the way that. Barca were with the results that Barca are also getting. Um, 
and Chavi was the coach, uh, uh, yeah, like if you flipped it, I think it would have been definitely he would have been scrutinized heavily. Uh, I like it. It also depends, and this is interesting, Diego. I think Real Madrid's board has changed a lot in the way they view things. I think it's like, for example, Carlo was terrible in La Liga last season. And the Champions League semifinals, like, you know, I'm forgiving of that because we got to the semifinals and we lost to an incredible team. Okay, like, I can't, like, we can't hang our head too much about that one. But La Liga hurt because it was terrible. And then we won Copa del Rey. I think if this was, like, seven, five, seven years ago, Carlo would have been sacked for what he got, he did last season. I think the club has changed in their approach to that. And I think Ancelotti has a lot of credit in the bank now for what he's done for the club. And so I think it also depends on which Real Madrid regime are you asking. I think if you're asking about Real Madrid of five years ago and before that, Xavi would have been sacked at Christmas. But I think if it's, you know, this version of it, for whatever reason, is more patient. So it depends, I guess. I mean... Come on, like, you know, I, I know, like, okay, so do I feel like we haven't had closure on a lot of topics. I, I, you, so, look, I'm not saying Real Madrid, maybe everything goes to shit in the second half of the season. We know that Real Madrid have slumps in January after the winter break. It might, in this case, look, at least we're getting players back now slowly, so that actually helps us a little bit. But, uh, I don't know if you're paying attention, but Ancelotti has actually had an amazing season. Like, the fact that we lost Chiumeni, Camavinga, Vinicius, Militao, Courtois, Alaba had an ACL injury, I think, since we last spoke. I don't know if we even talked about that. So we were missing Militao and Alaba to ACL tears. I mean, having three ACL tears in one season is unprecedented. I don't know if it's ever happened. you you got to be paying attention a little bit. He's done an amazing job this season. Hmm. No, I said, first of all, I didn't say, I said light years better, huh? I, I don't know what you're saying. Well, I don't see the world of difference in, let's say, like quality of play. Is Madrid right now playing better? Yes. Is it light years better? You know, I think that, in my opinion, no. But uh, you, can, you can argue that, you know, it, it is light year or that it, again, I, I just don't see the world of difference between, Barça and Real Madrid from uh, how they are playing at the moment. I don't, I don't think that Madrid are, are playing that much better. And <clears throat> yet it seems like... I mean, there's never any criticism towards Angelotti or Madrid coming from the press ever. There, There's never... You tell me, uh, tell me the article or or something. I I I just don't see it. I don't see it. You mean this season specifically? Yeah, this season, but also, I mean, even even last season. I mean, you guys lost the league, you know, with with so many games in hand, and and really, did, was there a lot of uh, okay? So I look I, I, towards I, Angelotti. Not really, dude. Not really. I'm admittedly the wrong person to ask about this because I don't read. Spanish press. I don't read Marco Ross, for example. Mm. And so I don't really know necessarily what they write, if it's scathing or not. I would be shocked if they didn't criticize him for last season. I mean, look, we're a publication. I know we're not on that level, but uh, we were quite critical of him in the league last season. I was even I, as understanding as I am about the city loss, I also was critical of that game, the way Ancelotti approached that. I'd be shocked if there wasn't criticism two years ago when we lost the 4-0 against Barca. I mean, we were critical. And then even PSG first leg and everything up until that point was disastrous. And then it turned. But I, I mean, I again, I don't know. I'm not the best person to ask. This. I don't really know who's writing what in that particular aspect. But I also think part of this has to do with Ancelotti himself and the way he is. Because I think the press will calculate their criticism sometimes based on what they think about the person. 
for example, there was crit criticism of Mourinho, right? The way he was. Zidane too. Zidane hated the press. Zidane answered the press with one word answers. He just hated being there. And so they didn't really like him for those reasons. With Ancelotti, it's a totally different. He like as a he's he's so polite with everyone. I think it's I'm not saying it's the be all end all and that's why, but I'm sure it factors in. Like the way he treats the press is different than some of the, the previous coaches. I've never really heard anyone speak ill about Carlo Ancelotti. I don't think it exists. Uh, like for example, you, you, you mentioned the way he, he addresses the press. I don't think Xavi is necessarily rude in no, the he's not. in which he addresses I have, the press. I, 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 I think Xavi's complain, been fine, yeah. He's respectful. When Xavi makes a mention of the state of the pitch, he becomes a meme and a laughing stock in the press. Well, as he instantly. should. I mean, that is a meme. But Angelotti comment. did the exact same thing. Like a few weeks ago, he complained about the state of the pitch, and nobody says nothing. Nobody well, I, says anything. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the way the complaints are put forth are different. So okay, so here uh, you are cla you are Pedro, okay? You are classic <laughs> Jose Pedro because Pedro complained about Pedro is a coule. Listen, listen, Pedro complained about Kuman. Uh, well, everyone complaining complained about, about Kuman. Complain? No, no, but he was actually pro Kuman. But but he made a mention of one of his shows about Kuman complaining about the referees. He said Barca shouldn't complain about the referees. A week later, Zizou went on to complain about the referees, and he put an infamous tweet out out there because everybody was obviously calling him in on his, uh, you know, double standards. Said Zizu complains with elegance. <laughs> Yo, you got you got to you got to respect so that's, that. So that's that's now what you're saying with Ancelotti. He's complaining with elegance. What I'm saying is Ancelotti mentions it in passing, and Xavi emphasizes it as an excuse. I don't know, man. I, I would have to see both again. That that's a you know, like that's too one hard. of my favorite coaches in the world is Jurgen Klopp, but even I find it ridiculous when he complains about wind and and grass. I and by the way, I don't like when Ancelotti complains about it either. But I don't think he's also emphasizing it. You know, the day maybe it is. Maybe elegance. it is elegance. Or, maybe it is elegance. Maybe Ancelotti is the the Zidane of Zidane uh, manager version of the way Zidane played on the field. Elegance, <clears throat> maybe. But um, so you're 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 fully on the Ancelotti boat. For the time remaining, are you no? But seriously, in all in all uh, seriousness, are you happy about this uh, contract extension? Well, look, I, I don't think the contract extension actually changes that much. All it is, it's mm -hmm. a, it's a vote of confidence. Yeah, right. Midway exactly. through the season, it's like, hey, we sure. believe in you, and it gives you insurance just in case Brazil try to tap him up in the off season. Like you're not worried, you lost your coach. Because you have no guarantee with the whole Chabi Alonso thing anyway. And Chabi Alonso is a young manager. He has a whole career ahead of him. I'm sure one day he'll coach Real Madrid. I don't know. But uh, I, I got to tell you, I, like the way uh, my opinion has changed quite a bit. Mm. And the way I've started to understand how success works has changed a little bit too. And I think... Sometimes the mo it's Occam's razor. Sometimes the most simple approach is the best approach. Sometimes someone who just unlocks the best in all your players and everyone respects, sometimes that's the best way. You know? And I think there's a simplicity and obviously his the book he wrote, The Quiet Leadership, is a very apt description of the ship that is being sailed right now by him is he has a very smart coaching staff. He has the analytics department. He's not obviously tactically inept. I think sometimes we totally exaggerate this whole narrative that Ancelotti is just throwing darts at a tactical board and, and spinning a wheel. He obviously was a, a very intelligent player himself, and he's a very intelligent coach. And what matters most really is like all the players want him there, you know? And that's the key difference. If the players are bought in, what else do you want? What else do you need? If the, if that if the harmony is there, everyone wants him there, then uh, 
that's the most important thing. So yeah, I'm definitely all in, and I and I've definitely changed my stance on him. And I think I was, I don't know if like if I if I was wrong about him, mm. in the sense that I think the criticisms at those times were fair towards him, but I think I was wrong about him in the sense that I think his managerial style, I undervalue how important the way he coaches how important that is and i think i was wrong about that part Mm -hmm. i think yeah i mean look i get and and really that's all we are asking or that's uh, let me limit it down to myself i think that's all i'm asking is to have that kind of peace and tranquility uh for chavi and and for barca as an institution and and that's just very difficult to do uh and that's something i think is is also in angel in angelotti's favor is right now this just um Despite the fact that Madrid are coming off of an underwhelming season, uh, with all respects to the Copa del Rey and, of, and, and reaching the Champions League final, which is, is, is should be held, uh, I think, at high regard, but in the league, as you mentioned as well, it was underwhelming. <clears throat> you know, this season, there just seems to be this tranquility and calmness that everything's going to be fine. Of course, we're witnessing the explosion of, of Bellingham as one of the best players in, in the world. Um, Angelotti's faring well despite all the injuries and you guys have new players coming up we saw some some you know uh, glimpses of, of uh, Arda Güler uh, in the last game that, that obviously are, are very exciting and for Xavi it's the complete I think polar opposite again I don't think that the teams are differ so much in terms of play I don't think that Madrid are light years ahead of where Chavi's team at the moment. The results are going your way. Uh, there, there's an account uh, that I've been following for a, a long time, Archivo VAR, who it's in a Twitter account that keeps tabs with all of the VAR decisions, I think in a Spanish top flight. It's it's purely based on statistics. Uh, you should check out their, their account and their website. They put out an article uh, just over the new year, I think it was, that shows that actually the league standings will be completely parallel if we eliminate the mistakes that VAR have made at the moment, meaning Girona, Madrid, and Barca will be tied on 44 points apiece. So uh, I think you're, you're talking also very fine detail. There's a fine line between where Xavi is at the moment with his team and the scrutiny that he's receiving to the calmness uh, that uh, Angelotti is experiencing with his team, um, you know, and and then and that's taken away from the institutional problems of Barca compared to you know also the, the, the more healthy state of of club affairs for Real Madrid. It's um, like I said, I mean, I think it's kind of a perfect storm right now where it's going to be the going is going to continue to be tough for Barca. I think it's going to be smooth sailing for Madrid in the league. And um, no, I don't. And think I don't so. know, dude. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I, 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 I there's I think a whole Chavi, half of Chavi the league be... to play, man. I mean, there's so much yeah, that could but, happen. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I, I don't see it happening right now. The, the state, like the mood, the state of affairs, just couldn't be any different, man. And, 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 and again, maybe you, you perceive it differently from the outside, but I think when you're here. It's 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 very palpable, and it's just like uh, changing up these dynamics. At least this season, it's going to be very difficult for Xavi. Uh, and I think, and, and, and not to like downgrade Angelotti and the achievement that will be winning this league title. Um, you know, I'm I'm not saying it's like carved in stone, but it, it just feels like Madrid are champions in the making and of the La Liga any, uh, at the very least. And that for Xavi, it's going to be a very, very tough and long season where he'll have to, you know, yeah, make very comfortable, uncomfortable appearances in the hot seat, I think. I, I just know that football changes so quickly, and we've been fans long enough to know that. And all it would take for all of this conversation to change is for Barca to win the Spanish Super Cup, beat Napoli and Real Madrid, have some kind of freak elimination against Leipzig, and all of a sudden, 
You'll be rolling off the R's in the, in the churros intro, my friend. I don't know, man. I don't know. Do, like, have you ever worked in a toxic environment? Um, like, have you worked for a company where yes. you're like dreading to go there every day and it's like, you know, it's just going to be negative energy and yeah, it's that that can really be not just long winded, but it just sucks the life out of you. It sucks the energy, it sucks the joy out of you. Sure. And I think that's what the Barça dressing room is at the moment. Um, mm. Yeah, I see it in other sporting sections as well, like with the basketball team. I, I, I just feel like there's such a, it's just such a negative climate at the moment uh, that I, I don't see how, you know, it took a Ronaldinho and obviously a young Laporta to get Barca out of the darkness and, and, and had them spearhead them towards the light. And that right now is it, it it's not there. It's and I don't know what it'll take. I think it might take something even more severe than what we are aware of and a whole change of uh well we'll see. We'll see where it leads. But I, I think uh right now this this yeah, negativity, this state of, of ne- negativity, this negative state of Barça will will be here for for some time to to come, to be honest. And that's me trying to be optimistic, like I said. <laughs> Well, uh, you're right about the culture and how that can drag on you. Um, but, you know, again, things can change. Who knows? I don't know. Uh, for your sake and my sake, I'm being optimistic as well for you guys because it's better for me to have that reality in check than uh, getting myself too high on a Real Madrid season. So, like I said, man, I've been a fan long enough to know that things change really quickly. So... Yeah. With that, man, it's ending on a somber note, man. Can we you feel that? You yeah, feel I don't that like that. You, just you infected, in. we infected me with your Chavi locker room. I feel like I'm in the locker room right now with, with Chavi Dude, and the boys. It's, I'm sorry, but it's the truth, man. It's the truth. It is. <clears throat> uh, I, I can't open a goddamn social media channel or any newspapers here without just feeling the somberness and uh the state of of animosity as well like everyone's at war with each other it it, it it's uh, attacks constantly towards the coach the president it's it's awful can i uh can i lift this up a little bit please do the nba is really fun right now mm. if you want to uh boost your morale and you want to take your mind off of football please get into nba stuff man nba is so fun every night i mean lebron is playing like he's 27 yeah and uh the raptors just made a trade they're three and one since the trade rj barrett just put up 37 points against the warriors last night and uh that was incredible the canadians are dominating right now shea and okc just on another level the Clippers are starting to come together. That's cool. Look at that smile. For see, like you got, I think you you were you are an NBA junkie. I think you would start I watching do. basketball. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I do need to do that. You're right. What else, my friend? That's it, man. I have another podcast starting in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> You're like one more minute on this podcast, and I'm gonna be borderline suicidal. I need to get out. Eject. <clears throat> Eject. Uh, it, I got, no, I have another podcast starting. You no, know, last time, minutes. last time, yes, last time we, uh, you can go over there and be in your jolly Madridista land and talk about jolly things. Uh, well, the the last one, the Arda Guler debut, was just an orgasm festival of yes, because you know the Turkish army on social media is out of the control. I it's, saw your it's like, tweet. It's it like surpasses Messi Cristiano. It's it's a different okay. beast. Yes. So so passionate, so uh, so passionate, and uh, you're not allowed to say anything negative about anyone. <laughs> I'm really worried if Arda Guler has a bad game. Like I'm like scared to criticize. I I don't want to like get death threats. Well, now you have Papa Flo and all the Turkish fans watching over your shoulders. So yeah, you know, be careful, my friend. But well, what I wanted to say was uh, last time we were on this podcast. It was uh, Churros Invitados. 
So we finished it with uh, the second episode of uh, Churros Invitados, and I'm uh, excited to announce we have a very special third guest already lined up. When we will make it happen, that will be a question of coordinating agendas. He's on a completely different time zone from Kian and myself, uh, at least most of the time. But it will be a very special guest, so make sure that you guys subscribe to Churros y Tacticas uh the patreon page that is so that's patreon.com forward slash churros y tacticas for uh these very cool and different podcasts these episodes where kian and i get to uh welcome a friend of the show a guest and uh like i said the next one will be a special one so stay tuned beautiful all right thanks guys see you over on patreon.com slash churros y tacticas and happy new year glad to be back